day, everyone. Adam Brandon here, president of FreedomWorks, and I'm joined by David Bonson, who is a Wall Street warrior and the author of this new book, There's No Th Free Lunch. David, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Look, I know you just finished taping for Prager, and I'm glad we get this little bit of a sneak peek. I know our audience loves watching Prager, you. But tell us, why did you write this book? I really believe that we have a lot of people in the society that are instinctively favorable to free markets. Right. They have a sort of impulse in favor of free enterprise, but not a foundation, not the intellectual or even moral foundation to defend markets. So now that's being challenged. It's being challenged on the left. We know AOC and Bernie Sanders and, of course, college campuses. So there's this sort of fondness of uh, progressive socialism that maybe we thought died in the 20th century. And there's even some challenges coming from the right sometimes, where there's just not the necessary uh, foundation in place to defend a free enterprise as a belief system. So we're living in a world right now, that, a, a world that I was taught when I was in college, this is ancient history. And then I was told, uh, you know, that, that when you listen to the Fed and everyone, this is something we have to worry about. In fact, our biggest threat is deflation, mm -hmm. right? We worry about becoming Japan. Yeah. And all of a sudden, this inflation word is up. And we were told it was going to pass, and now it kind of hasn't passed. And now people are starting to get scared that that ancient yeah. inflationary concept is back today. Tell me about inflation. So I have both fears at once. And yet, one of the things I think is amazing about the current inflationary fear is we're talking about as if it's all brand new because it's hit goods and services, food, energy. In housing, health care, and college tuition, inflation never went away. We had outsized inflation for the last 25 years. Housing, health care, and education. And There's what are these something in common with the, all three. Uh, the government subsidizing of these things was, in fact, the inflation-causing component. Well, where right now I think fears about deflation and Japanification were and are entirely justified because of what the excessive mm -hmm. debt has done to our growth capacity. We've pulled forward so much growth. The problem now is that on the supply side, people are realizing we're not getting enough productive activity mm -hmm. to keep up with demand and it's putting upward pricing pressure. I fear that if there is some subsiding of the inflation that we're seeing right now, mm -hmm. that people will say, okay, look, it all worked out. When in reality, the housing, healthcare, and college tuition components will remain because we haven't let's, learned that government subsidy. Let's go through those three really yeah. quickly. How is the government driving up the cost to higher education? Because uh, wait, they're giving us these loans, right? That's right. So it's uh, that's perhaps the most direct. They have a monopoly on financing college education. You really cannot get a student loan outside of federal government. So college administrators have carte blanche because no one is price sensitive. They can go and get whatever they want to go to Oregon State or a real elite university. And I'm not trying to diss on Oregon <laughs> State, but the fact of the matter is no one would have thought of Oregon State as a $250,000 educational experience before there was unlimited capacity for finance. My undergrad alma mater, I think, is $65,000 a year plus room and board. Plus room and board. And, and so there's um, basically... But I could show up tomorrow and someone will write me the check. No matter what. And there's a total disconnect from what the risk reward of that is, the cost benefits. Mm -hmm. No one is looking to say, what is my earning capacity after receiving this degree? Parents are not looking at it as to what the whole experience will generate. They've totally disintermediated normal And, and health care. So how is government involvement driving up the cost of health care? And, and in terms of health care, it's a similar economic philosophy when you remove price sensitive actors from the equation and setting price. Mm -hmm. So the people that are now setting prices in healthcare are intermediaries that are not the ones receiving the service. So government strong backing, Medicare, even before Obamacare, had become over a quarter of all healthcare delivery. Mm -hmm. But Obamacare combined with Medicare is now well over 50%. And then even on the private market, it's still through the insurance market that is right. disintermediated uh, cost benefits. Well, that's analysis. something that's hard for someone like me who's trying to save like the free market and health care. So I know in your book you get into government spending. Give us a little preview on what you talk about. Well, my fundamental thesis is that government spending is not only wrong because we can't afford it. And that's where the right has been focused for a while. And I don't disagree with the right. I think running deficits are um, a bad idea. 
But the left is very capable of saying, okay, no problem. Let's just raise taxes to fund it. Mm -hmm. I don't want the size of government merely because of the red ink. Mm -hmm. My problem is that the size of government is necessarily an extraction from the productive side of the economy. Right. That every dollar the government gets, even if they're funding their high level of spending, which they're not, even if they were, they can only fund it through taxation. And of course, the other aspect is, is deficit spending. So it's either current confiscation or future confiscation. So I always like to point out the moral argument to this. All of this debt and deficit is coming on our children and grandchildren's back. And it may not even just be through them actually spending the money to do it. It comes from their back and what we're seeing now with stagnation. 1.6% real GDP growth for the last 15 years is half of our post-World War II average. Wow. And so that is a moral argument. Our kids and grandkids deserve better than half of the economic vibrancy that we've lived through. Mm -hmm. So I believe that you not only are sticking them with the bill, the, the argument is, well, it's okay, they can stick the bill with their kids. Right. There's this can-kicking acceptance that is entirely immoral and non-economic, but fundamentally, they're pushing down economic opportunity. My favorite topic right now is risk, because coming out of COVID, I feel that as a society, we've become very, very risk adverse. Yeah. And to me, that's one of the greatest things about the United States is this culture of risk. We're gonna come here, we're gonna build our businesses, we're gonna chase our futures, and it doesn't always work out, but that's something we embrace. Well, this is why, Adam, it's so important that people understand economics as the study of human action. Humans act and humans are risk-taking creatures. Mm -hmm. They do so because there is um, uh, an adventure, an opportunity, an aspiration, and we have to have both sides of risk and reward to get to where we want to be. Entrepreneurs who succeed almost always first failed. Mm -hmm. What we've done is tell ourselves that we're risk averse by merely looking for government to set backstops or to penalize people who mm -hmm. are successful in reward taking. And so we're trying to transfer risk around instead of accepting that actually risk reward, both borne by the person taking it with capital, with labor, mm -hmm. with ideas, with, with time, heart, and treasure. These things are what are at the heart of the entrepreneurial system because that's what economics is, is human action. Right. So we think we can program a spreadsheet and econometrically mm -hmm. strip away risk. That is to basically deny human activity its role in the great growth of the economic experiment that has been the American dream. I wish we had more time, yeah. but we don't. So everyone out there, there's no free lunch. This is a fantastic book, not just to warm yourself up on the principles of economics and free market capitalism, but this is a fantastic book to give to people in your family uh, that maybe not think in the same way you do. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Adam. Appreciate it.